What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. So with the Xbox, FTC, Activision Blizzard stuff winding down, we are getting more information around those deals that Microsoft was giving out for Call of Duty. And apparently with Nintendo, theirs may actually extend to other Activision franchises. We'll talk about that though here today. Also, we are gonna be taking a look at those new Game Pass tiers that Microsoft introduced as there seems to be some confusion going around, especially with one tier in particular. And we'll also be discussing that all digital future that continues to inch closer and closer as now one large retail chain has decided to just stop selling physical video games altogether. Guys, if you enjoy these videos, make sure you hit that like button, helps out a ton. And if new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below. And we're gonna start today with a bunch of older retro titles just heading to the Xbox this week. And we can see this posted up over on antstream.com where they have over 1300 classic games, 600 mini game challenges. And you can see all the different systems that they're supporting with Game Boy games being in there, Atari, Jaguar, a PS1, there's a lot of stuff from the old days, the 80s and the 90s, what have you. Um, but they have a 12 month pass and a lifetime pass. So the 12 month pass, $30, lifetime pass being 80. There is one very important thing to note here though, before you decide to buy into this, it's called AntStream for a reason because it is cloud-based, as in you're streaming all of these games. Now, I saw RGT did a video kind of showcasing it in action and well, for him, who it was a whole thing just to get him to plug in an Ethernet cable to his Xbox so we would get a better connection for him on playing different games online. So this working for him through Wi-Fi, at least as well as he showed in his video, I mean, that is at least a confidence boost to the, to the platform itself. But it is heading to the Xbox this week on July 20th. Check it out if you don't mind the cloud streaming aspect and you want access to a bunch of older titles. Also, we did have a bit of a surprising announcement as this is for a Sonic game that was specifically designed for the Xbox 360 Connect. Take a look at this. This is a video posted up on YouTube announcing this. As it appears, there's a Sonic Freeriders No Connect patch, which is exactly what it sounds like. It removes the requirement for that Connect. This is released version 1.0 and it's just available to download through the Google Drive link that they have in the description there. I haven't had a chance to try this, but I will admit, I never really played Sonic Freeriders and a lot of that had to do with the Kinect just being a requirement, me kind of falling out of it after the uh, the initial appeal of it and like the, the all factor of, oh, I don't need a controller and then it quickly sinks in that it's not a very accurate device to, to use. So when you get games like Sonic Freeriders kind of linked to it, it's unfortunately just kind of, it kind of passes you by. And in this case though, removing that requirement means you can actually emulate this on your PC because Xbox 360 emulators have continued to progress to actually pretty good now. So yeah, you get the game however you can, and then you apply the patch and yeah, you can just play it with a controller. So interesting stuff, definitely a Sonic game I missed out on. And Maybe it's worth a look now that I don't need that connect. Oh, and here's another interesting bit of news that has to do with the Xbox 360 generation. As we mentioned that the Call of Duty servers were coming back on. Well, apparently that affected the Shadowrun community. Yeah, Shadowrun, the game from the Xbox 360, right? Like the PVP kind of Overwatch game right before Overwatch. Well, it turns out that it's actually better now than it was previously because Microsoft fixed it. Yeah, take, take a look at this. This posts up over on Video Gamer, who says, to many people's surprise, Microsoft not only fixed the issue, but uh, Monkey also noted that the servers actually kind of works better than it has ever worked in the history of the game being up. Before the fix, matches used to take over 30 seconds to be found, but after the revival of the game servers, Monkey noted that this now takes around three seconds. So there you have it. The Call of Duty servers are back up and functioning on Xbox 360. Same with Shadowrun, and Shadowrun is also backwards compatible, similar to those Call of Duty games. So yeah, you can you can pop in these different titles right to your Xbox series, or I guess go on the store and pick them up and start playing like it's the old days of the Xbox 360. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with Call of Duty, Microsoft, and Nintendo. We know that there was a deal put in place because 
Microsoft was announcing these deals all over the place. Obviously, they were trying to get these out into the public eye, so it looked like they were trying their hardest to uh, to bring Call of Duty to as many people as possible to get the deal past regulators. And, well, it seems like they were successful, and I'm sure this played a part into it, especially with NVIDIA and the, the cloud side of things, them making that deal. But Nintendo did get a 10-year Call of Duty agreement. Well, it turns out maybe it extends beyond Call of Duty. This we can see posted up by Xputer, who points this out in some of the filings that were made public with the FTC during all those hearings that were going on, where they say, Nintendo has a contractual right to obtain Activision content post-merger, including Call of Duty, as mentioned in the pages 74 and 120. Now, I will admit, looking at this, it does say, appear that Wait, does that mean that Nintendo's gonna get everything from Activision? Past and present and future? Well, it's pretty vague in the way that it's worded here as they uh, are kind of uh, referring to a contract that we can't look at line by line necessarily. Some of those terms are redacted and there were at times entire pages that were completely blanked out. And I'm sure it was referring to more specific details in those contractual agreements. But in this case, it does kind of sound like yeah, you could see a lot of those titles head to the Switch or Nintendo's next system. I will say though, it's it's possible what this really means is yes, Nintendo is absolutely getting Call of Duty and there is basically a lane of communication and window open for other games going forward on a case by case basis. As in Microsoft is saying, we're not gonna lock off all these other games from the potential of being on Nintendo's platform just because we now own Activision Blizzard we've seen Microsoft actually take full advantage of the Switch with some of their releases like a Minecraft where it actually makes more money on the Switch than it does on the Xbox. So in that case, if you're Microsoft, yeah, maybe you do wanna put a new Spyro game on the Switch as well as the Xbox, maybe a new Crash Bandicoot, maybe Tony Hawk Pro Skater. These are all games that I would like to see happen, but obviously their, their big focus first and foremost is Call of Duty, and that is already agreed to be going to not only the Switch, but Nintendo's next platform. In fact, it was specifically talked about here, which we can see the other passage that was pointed out, where they say Xbox has also contractually agreed to provide a version of Call of Duty to Nintendo for its Switch console and its upcoming console upgrade, which, I mean, Microsoft believes that's coming in 2024. All of us believe it's coming in 2024, but we still need to see Nintendo because they like to throw curveballs now and then. But the good thing about this is it's specifically pointing out the current Switch and Nintendo's next platform. There were questions about that, but Nintendo uh, has that 125 million or so user base right now, and that was quoted by Microsoft when trying to convince regulators that this deal should pass because they'd be bringing Call of Duty to 125 million potential new customers on the Switch. So they can't necessarily then go, oh no, we're we're not doing any kind of Call of Duty there, we're just going to the next platform because, well, that's gonna technically start at zero whenever Nintendo launches it. Either way, this is certainly something to keep an eye on, especially on the buildup to Nintendo's next system release, which again, we're all kind of thinking 2024. I believe holiday 2024 is most likely, and maybe there'll be some other Activision games there next to Call of Duty, we'll see. Next up, let's talk about Microsoft and kind of a change when it comes to Xbox Live and Game Pass. Xbox Live is being retired officially on September 1st, which is really an end of an era. I mean, that was back on the original Xbox leading all the way up to 2023, so about 21 years or so of that branding with Xbox Live, but now it's all about Game Pass and it does make sense for Microsoft to try to consolidate all of the, these brandings and subscription services together under one umbrella as Game Pass is their primary focus. However, they introduced it, talked about how they were gonna transition Xbox Live Gold members over to this Game Pass core model, which means your subscription fee wouldn't necessarily change if you're updating or up, updating yearly with that $60 price, but you would be getting access to much better games than what they've been doing with Games with Gold, which, I mean, we just made fun of basically here every single month because it was that bad. But like, here example is the list of games, if you missed it, that you will get access to when they do indeed shift over, which on September 14th, Xbox Live Gold members will automatically become uh, Game Pass core members, all right? So you'll have access to, uh, what, Dishonored 2, Doom Eternal, Fable Anniversary, uh, Gears 5, that's a good one, Halo 5, 
Eh, Hellblade said it was Sacrifice, uh, Inside, Psychonauts 2, State of Decay 2. I mean, there's some good stuff in there, right? But the thing that really seemed to throw people through a loop is when we got down to some of the tiers and comparisons where they have the different plans. They have four different tiers, which includes core, console, PC, and ultimate. The one that's throwing people off is console. So you see core, it has online console multiplayer and that catalog of 25 games. Whereas console has new games on day one, member deals and discounts, sure, and then hundreds of high quality games on console. Basically, console is just Game Pass without the online play. PC, well, they can't charge for online play, but you do get the EA Play membership. And then Ultimate is everything else, right? Online play, EA Play, new games day one, deals, discounts, hundreds of high quality games, PC, cloud, all this, right? So it's weird because console is a dollar more than core, but does not have online multiplayer. And the way I look at this is, what Microsoft wants you to do is go from core to ultimate. They don't want you to go from core to console. In fact, they want you to go console to ultimate as well. That, that's their main goal is to get everyone up to paying $16.99 a month for all these different benefits. And technically, if you're someone who mostly just plays free to play games online, and then you also wanna have access to the Game Pass library for some of the single player stuff, or even just playing these heavily focused on multiplayer games offline, I guess, as long as you have that kind of mode, then yeah, that would probably work for you. But I I think we are to a point where the idea of paying for online on these consoles is kind of archaic now. I mean, at the time when it first came up during the original Xbox era and Microsoft was trying to push that, it, it made sense for the time, I'll say, because of the cost it took to get Xbox Live off the ground in the background with all the servers and, and everything they were doing there. But now it's to the point where there are so many people online playing these different games and these companies are making a ton of money from things just outside of you paying your pass to get online. I don't really think they need it anymore, especially when you make the comparison to PC. It's tough then because the console players are paying to play online, whereas on PC, you don't do that. So I think it'd be a really cool thing to see Microsoft set the tone once again and just eliminate the need to pay to play online because then there'd be a lot of pressure on Nintendo and Sony, which would be kind of funny on Nintendo's part because they just started charging for online with the Switch generation. But that's just what I'd like to see. However, I understand the confusion though. Core, cheaper than console, but you can play online whereas you can't with console. It is a weird looking chart with the features attached to it. Next up, let's talk about an update when it comes to the CMA and Microsoft. They were trying to work all this out in court once again yesterday and it hasn't necessarily gotten to a point where it seems that Microsoft will be closing today, although some people still kind of believe they will. It, it we'll, we'll see, obviously, by the end of today. But take a look. This post up by The Verge, who is following all of this during the CMA hearing very, very closely, where they say the UK's Competition Appeal Tribunal has agreed with some requirements that need to be satisfied on Thursday to pause Microsoft's appeal of the CMA decision to block the Activision Blizzard merger. Both the CMA and Microsoft requested this last week to allow them to negotiate over a cloud gaming deal. The CMA has also extended the date for its final order from July 18th to August 29th. So it's likely that Microsoft's deal will tick past the July 18th deadline and could see a temporary extension. So it does appear that Microsoft and the CMA are attempting to negotiate this a bit more to close the deal with basically everyone approving it. And we know the CMA's big hangup is the cloud and Microsoft does at least seem willing to work that end out by even spinning off the rights for cloud gaming in the UK specifically to another company. But something like that does take time. And unfortunately, they're up against it with that that deadline being today with Activision Blizzard. However, at this point, it wouldn't be shocking that Activision would go, oh, wow, they overcame the FTC, the EU's approved it, all these other regulators across the world have approved it. It's just the CMA and even they appear like, okay, let's get this worked out. Even the judge was saying, look guys, this is going to go through seemingly. Let's work this out so it's amicable at the end and everyone can walk away feeling like they, they basically won, right? So that's kind of where they are now. And it seems that while that next like date is set up for August 29th, that they are planning to get this thing done much sooner than that. So I'm looking, I'm thinking that there's gonna be a temporary extension that could go one to two weeks. 
and then maybe we get more information about them amicably coming to an agreement, and then Microsoft closed the deal with everyone approving it across the board. But there is, believe it or not, one other hang up, and this is, this is kind of a funny one. You can see this posted up by Steven Dottila, who did notice this, saying on Friday, the Ninth Circuit of Appeals denied the request by the plaintiffs in the so-called gamer suit to get an injunction to block the Activision Microsoft deal. They're now appealing that ruling to the Supreme Court. You read that right though, the gamer suit, as there is a collection of gamers who apparently are opposing this deal, which, I mean, technically they can, and they've just been shot down constantly throughout this entire thing. And I, I guess they're spending the money to appeal to the Supreme Court. I don't really see that going their way either. So I wouldn't pay this much attention to it. I mean, people were asking, oh, is this the FTC doing it? No, it, it's it's the gamer suit. People coming together to try to oppose Microsoft. So I don't I don't really think this is going to get very far. I don't, I don't think it's going to really do much in terms of the Supreme Court coming in and blocking this deal or anything. I believe once they work it out with the CMA, this thing will close and hopefully that's all done by like the first or second week of August and we can finally have this saga come to an end with Activision Blizzard and Microsoft. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about that all digital future once again. It comes up from time to time when things are happening that make me think we're getting closer and closer to that being an all digital present. And this latest news shows a larger retail store seemingly just done selling physical copies of games. And the reasoning is what you would expect. We can see this posted up by gamesindustry.biz saying that the UK supermarket chain Tesco will no longer stop stock physical video games in its 2,800 stores. The reasoning, well, it's the move from its customers towards digital entertainment. This also follows the news that GameStop Ireland has closed all of its 35 stores, operated eight stores in Dublin, six in Cork, and three in Limerick. Okay, so it's interesting because we know that the hardware manufacturers, specifically Sony and Microsoft, are working to push more and more people towards their services like Game Pass or PlayStation Plus or just shopping on their digital storefronts. They have systems out there that don't have disk drives. Like they obviously are selling you that with them in mind of, oh, you're not going to go out to a retail store to get your game. Then on the other side, we have retailers who are probably realizing that their video game section is less and less of a draw every single year. That's one of the big reasons these stores have these video game sections. It's not because they make a ton of money from it because uh, I'll tell you now, the margins on new games, very, very slim. I, I, I remember at one point we were ordering new copies of games, $53.50 after shipping, and we were selling them for 60 bucks. So <laughs> you can kind of realize, oh wow, there's like $6 of margin on there and you get into the cost of employees, and all kinds of stuff around it it was barely worth keeping new games in stock unless you would get trade-ins on them and that's how you would make uh, the money there. Much higher margin on a used game versus a new game. But in this case, the reason for having them in these stores was to draw people in and maybe they would buy other things that have higher margins. But the more people stay at home, whether it's because of the, the pandemic or because of what's happening with these, uh, these digital systems, well, there's less and less people heading out to these stores to pick up games. And well, that means there's less and less reason to keep them around. Considering a lot of these companies will look at square footage as like each square foot is worth a certain dollar amount because they have to monetize for it to make sense, especially with that large store. So I'm actually not surprised to hear that a chain of 2,800 stores is like, nah, we're, we're good on our video game section going forward. We'll just sell those little cards that we can kind of hang up at, at checkout and maybe we'll get a couple of impulse buys here and there on, on that stuff, right? It doesn't take up any major floor space. So. That's that's something I would definitely be keeping an eye on here because I it wouldn't shock me if in a couple of years we hear about something similar from maybe a, a, a st big chain in the States, like a maybe a Target or a Walmart or something because even those video game sections look sadder and sadder every time I go there. They're barely ever kept up or stocked as it is. So uh, and I, we'll see, but again, something tells me 2028 rolls around. We're talking about the PlayStation 6 and whatever Microsoft calls their next Xbox and they're revealed to not have disk drives and we realize, oh wait, we are in the all digital present. And before we go to the comment of the day, we're gonna take a look at the poll that I posted up yesterday where I ask, what are you currently subscribed to on Xbox or PC? All right, so 57% are just not subscribed to any of these, but 35% are, hey, they are subscribed to Game Pass Ultimate, 3% on Xbox Live Gold, who will basically be thrown into that uh, 
that that Game Pass in general there, uh, and then Game Pass PC having four percent. All right, so I was really curious what Xbox Live Gold looked like right now, as again those are being converted to core and. Microsoft, their big play clearly is to continue to stack up Game Pass subscriptions. I've been wondering when they're going to announce what their next big number is. And it's been a little while since we heard, what, like 25 million or, or so, I believe. So uh, I'd like to see them show up with a number closer to 40 million in the next year. But uh, we'll see. It has been a bit of a struggle for them to continue climbing those numbers. But when you get Call of Duty, Activision Blizzard, all of that happening it should work to accelerate their Game Pass subscriber growth. So I guess we'll see over the next 12 months or so. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from uh, the one con saying, as a former Samsung 7 owner, I am all for that replaceable battery rule. I imagine if that rule was in place then, instead of recalling the whole phone, they probably just would have recalled the battery and or sent out replacement batteries. Still a costly endeavor, but likely not as costly as replacing the whole phone. What a fiasco that was. You know, it is interesting now to think about how a lot of these phones, tablets, game systems, mini PCs, the battery is sealed, like it's inside. You're not getting it out of there. There's no door just to pop off and the battery comes out. A lot of times they're glued to the frame. So most users are not gonna just rip the battery out at all. Even if you get it open, it's a whole thing there. So in, in some ways, the battery life is tied to the overall system life. And batteries can only charge, recharge all that so many times before they, they don't really work well anymore. And that means people would just recycle or throw out their phone and get a new one. And it causes a lot of waste. And that's one of the big reasons that I've seen that this regulation is being presented and pushed out there is to stop people from just throwing away their perfectly good phone or electronic because the battery that's stuck in there, it just stopped working over time, but it should be easily replaceable. So I like the idea of just putting more power back in the consumer's hands because these electronics aren't cheap. You should have access to something as basic as the battery. And ladies and gentlemen, that's gonna do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about here today was Nintendo's deal with Microsoft seemingly extending past Call of Duty. What big franchise do you think will show up on either the Switch Now or maybe the next generation system from Nintendo with Activision? Also, what about the whole situation right now with Xbox and these Game Pass tiers? I think it's weird that they introduced Core being cheaper than a console, but Core you can play online. Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.